Hello everyone, and welcome to the new ODB webinar and walkthrough. Today we want to talk about what new ODB is and how it works by examining our architecture, as well as walking through a few examples covering installation and configuration. So let's go ahead and get started. First we'd like to answer the question, what exactly is new ODB? The answer is, new ODB is a complete rethink of the relational database designed for cloud scale. We're a fully relational database because we're SQL based and asset compliant. You can use the same tools and the same query language to manage new ODB that you've been using for other databases. Also, we're cloud scale because we're fully elastic, able to scale up and down on demand using commodity hardware. To understand how we do all this, we want to show you our product architecture and walk through a few examples. Our architecture consists of three tiers, and collectively these tiers are referred to as a domain. First, the management tier, which is comprised of the management console and the broker agent. The management tier is where you configure and enable your new ODB installation. Next is the transaction handling tier, which is comprised of the transaction engines. These are the processes that handle the SQL requests from your application. And finally, the storage tier, which manages the read and write of your data to and from disk. We'll review the details of each tier in just a few minutes. But for now, it's important to understand that each tier is independent of the others. However, communication flows across all of them. Also, the new ODB platform is agnostic, meaning each tier can run on a different operating system, even in different data centers. Lastly, each tier can be extended to scale up and down as needed for failover and performance reasons. Now let's take a closer look at the components for each tier. The management tier consists of the management console and the broker process. The management console is the GUI that is used to configure the new ODB system. We'll take a closer look at this tool in a few minutes during the walkthrough. The broker process is running on at least one node and is responsible for coordinating all the communication between the application and the database. What this means is, when the application queries the database for the first time, it will ask the broker process which transaction engine it should use. Once the broker has made that initial introduction between the application and the transaction engine, it fades into the background and is not needed again unless the application needs to connect to a new transaction engine. There must always be at least one broker process running at all times. Next, the transaction handling tier consists of the transaction engines. These are the processes that are responding to the SQL requests from your application. The transaction engines store all data in memory. And when there, is no, when there is more than one transaction engine, they will communicate with each other to ensure that their data is in sync. Also, the transaction engines are responsible for sending data updates to the storage manager to be written to disk. And finally, the storage tier consists of the storage manager, which is responsible for fetching data from disk when necessary for the transaction engines, as well as keeping other storage managers in sync when there are more than one running. The storage managers are also responsible for writing data updates received from the transaction engines to disk for durability. It's very important that you know that the storage tier can reside on the local file system, as in this example, a SAN, a cloud instance of EC2, and new to beta 8, the Hadoop distributed file system. This slide diagram shows you the simplest implementation for new ODB, one broker, one transaction engine, and one storage manager. Each of these tiers could reside on a single server or reach on different servers across data centers. Also take note that each tier has at least one agent process. This process is used to manage communication across each tier in the deployment. If we look at a slightly more complex implementation, we see here that there are multiple broker processes running for failover, multiple transaction engines for failover and performance, and finally, multiple storage managers, again for failover reasons. Also in this example, each storage manager is using a different data store. One is using a SAN while the other is using HDFS. It's important to understand that the data is the same in each storage manager, regardless of the, of the data store that's in use. Also in this example, you see that there are multiple agents running in each tier. In this example, we're assuming that each transaction engine and storage manager are running on separate hardware and by default, each installation will have an individual agent process running. Now that we've reviewed the basic architecture, let's take a walk through the installation and configuration. Okay, 
Today we're installing on Windows 7 64-bit and to start things off we'll go ahead and double click the installation executable. So our install XE is already in our downloads folder so as you can see we're installing uh, beta 8. We'll double click here. Presented with a splash screen um, and the install will present us with this particular window to select which components uh, to install. Um, currently in the beta, there are, is no option to make any changes here, so we'll click Next. And we're prompted for our installation folder. Um, and similarly, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, accept the default installation path. And we'll click Install. And what we see in a matter of seconds is we're already installed, we're ready to go. Um, a quick note about the Show Details button here. Um, there's a lot of verbose information in here about um, you know, what's been installed and where. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail here, but uh, feel free to peruse that uh, on your own. Uh, nothing to worth shattering uh, being reported in there. We'll go ahead and click Close, and we'll see that uh, the new ODB Quick Start documentation, where we're prompted to, to go ahead and take a look at the Quick Start. Um, the Quick Start is, is a little outside the scope of uh, our walkthrough today, and we'll go ahead and click No. And that's it. Now that the install is complete, we can go ahead and walk through um, some configuration on this node. As you remember, the, the first thing we want to do is define a domain, and the domain is, is really is referring to the three tiers of our architecture, uh, the management tier, the transaction tier, and the storage tier. Um, so what we'll do to start our domain is we'll go to command prompt, and we'll go to our installation directory, so Windows Files x86, new ODB, and from in here, we'll go ahead and type in start java dash jar bin newo agent and the dash dash broker flag. Um, so a quick word here about the Nuo Agent Jar. Uh, whenever you're installing and, and you plan to run any of the tiers of NuoDB, um, you will need at least one agent process running. Uh, the broker itself is, is a specialized agent. Um, so um, all of these agents are, are used to communicate back and forth, uh, share information, so on and so forth. Um, we'll, we'll take a look once, we're, once we look at the, um, the walkthrough of, of the installation for, for a cloud and scale um, how this looks inside of new ODB, but just be aware that the agent has to be running on every tier uh, on every machine. Go ahead and uh, click enter there, and um, we are return to the command prompt, um, so we're up and running. Um, another important point here um, is that once Windows is rebooted uh, and the new ODB software is installed, uh, this broker agent process is automatically started for you. Obviously, we haven't rebooted the OS during this walkthrough, uh, so we've had to start the process manually. But this is an important distinction for those of you who are using Windows. So now that the agent is running, um, what we can do here is, is go in and, and start to populate our domain. The domain is, is, is available. It's empty. There are no transaction engines, no storage managers. Uh, but we can go ahead and change that in fairly short order. Uh, so our next step will be to go back to the search window, and we want to go to the NuoDB console. So right away in the console, this is the first time we've run it, obviously because this is a fresh installation. What we want to do is discover domains. And what we see here is we have a domain running, um, which is referring directly back to our broker. And we'll select join. And we're prompted for a password. Um, by default, our password here is all lowercase bird, B-I-R-D. So click OK. And we see that we have our default domain up and running. And our broker is running on our local host. The next step is to add uh, individual processes to run inside of the domain. So we'll select Add Process. And here we're prompted for a chorus, or to define a chorus. And just as domain has special meaning for new ODB, so does the word chorus. Uh, chorus really refers to um, the processes that are handling your data. Chorus, think of the chorus as your actual database. Um, so in this, in this case, the chorus is really referring to the transaction handling tier as well as the storage tier, so the transaction engines and the storage manager. So for, for our chorus, we'll go ahead and define it as hockey. We will select localhost, and we'll click next. And here we're, we're prompted to define the process type. Um, so we've got transaction engine and storage manager. Um, it doesn't matter which of these you define first. Um, 
out of habit, I tend to do the storage manager first. So we'll go to C colon temp whack webinar. Um, two notes about the directory. Uh, the directory needs to exist before we attempt to use it here. Uh, NuoDB will not dynamically create this directory for you. Uh, we'll dynamically create subdirectories off of here, but if we can't find it, we'll go ahead and error out. Um, also, uh, this directory could be anywhere. You know, we're, we're configuring a, a simple node here, just a one node um, server. Uh, but this can be on a, another server on our, on our WAN. Uh, this can be in the SAN, it can be in the cloud, um, it can be anywhere. As long as it's reachable by this particular machine, um, you can go ahead and use it as your, as your data repository. So we have our, our path defined. We'll go ahead and select initialize. Because it's new, we want to initialize uh, this setup. And we'll select finish. And right away we're brought back to our home screen. And we see we have our chorus defined as hockey and our storage manager defined on localhost. Our next step is to add another process. So we'll go back here. Again, we'll select hockey. And now we're going to define our transaction engine. Uh, by default, the transaction engine will be using uh, the storage manager that we had just defined. So we'll go ahead and type in a DBA username and DBA password. And we'll confirm the DBA password. I'll select finish. And that's it. So right away, in, in really a matter of minutes, we've got uh, our installation complete, and we've got our domain defined, and we've got our chorus, or our database defined as well. So this is great. Um, however, the database is empty, right? Like any other database that you started up uh, in the past, uh, there, there's really nothing uh, going on here. Um, so let's go back to our command window. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch um, NuoSQL. And NuoSQL is our uh, command line SQL interpreter. So I'll go to bin. New SQL executable. We're going to go to our hockey chorus. So hockey at localhost. User is DBA. Password is DBA. Schema is hockey. And we'll see we're right at a SQL prompt. Um, so right at the SQL prompt, um, now you can start entering in the SQL that you're accustomed to. So we can do show tables, and you'll see that there's nothing listed in here. So let's go ahead and create a table. Create table test underscore table data string Current time column of type timestamp, not null, default, and we're going to default uh, this column to put a timestamp in every time um, the, uh, the table is updated. Default now. There we go. So if we type in show tables again, we should see we have our test table created. Uh, obviously nothing in there, so let's go ahead and populate some data. So we're going to populate some data into our data column. And if we do a select star, we'll see that we've got data in there. We can go ahead and run our insert again. And another time, and run another select star.
Oops. And you'll see we've got those, uh, those additions going into the database. So straightforward SQL, uh, just as you'd expect. Um, really straightforward, very easy to use. Um, obviously, one of the, the other things that you can do here as well is if you're used to using a utility such as DB Visualizer or Squirrel, um, so long as it supports JDBC, uh, you should be able to connect it to NuoDB and, and use the, um, the GUI interface of your choice to go ahead and get some of this work done. Um, our next step here is to try and load a database schema and, and load, a, load a larger data set so you can get a, a feel for what a larger data set is going to look like. Um, so by default, I'm going to go to my little cheat sheet. So what we're doing here is we're going to execute NoSQL against hockey at localhost, same username and password. Uh, but this time we're going to pass it a um, uh, a SQL file uh, that will help to define the schema of the database for us. So there we go. Um, we've executed the command. Uh, no errors. Uh, this this output is is what we'd expect to see. And in fact, if we log back into new SQL. we see, in fact, that our hockey database, our hockey table has been created right there. So that's great. And if we do show you guys can easily see why I have a cheat sheet for the longer commands. So there we go, show hockey, and we're looking at our schema uh, within that table. So that's great. Now our, our next step is to populate that, that table with some actual data. Um, and We've got that information right here. And something to note, note we're using a tool called Nuo Loader. Uh, so Nuo Loader is our, our utility that we ship with. Uh, it will help you um, import data from CSV uh, or other flat file uh, into a, a defined database, into a defined table. Um, so we see Nuo Loader, we're calling the executable, uh, the schema, which is hockey, uh, which we'd already passed previously, uh, username and password. Uh, we're passing it um, a file called bruins.csv, uh, and this is in our samples directory, in our default install. So we'll pass it that file. We'll also give it the skip command, and what this does by default is it skips the first row uh, of, of information, which are usually your row headers. So we're going to go ahead and put the skip command in there, and then we're passing it a, a, the two flag with a straight SQL insert command and telling us uh, which, which course we want to use, the, the hockey at localhost at the end. So go ahead and paste that command in. And we see imported 25 rows, failed zero rows, uh, and some other uh, debug information there. So let's go back into new SQL. We see show tables, and we want to say select star from hockey. And there we go. You see all of that data that was just brought in. So that's it for our simple configuration. Uh, we've walked through um, the install. We've walked through getting some of the very basic um, components of NuoDB up and running uh, in a single node. Uh, the next uh, item we'll look at and the next uh, walkthrough we'll, we'll take a look at is um, walking through uh, something of a little more scale. We'll have uh, multiple servers running in a data center and uh, we'll walk through that setup and um, see how that looks when there's some load that's actually put against, um, put against the process. All right, so we've seen the architecture overview, the Windows installation, and the simple one node configuration. Now let's take a look at something a little more complex. We're going to walk through the configuration of a multi-node system consisting of multiple transaction engines and agents. And once that system is set up, we'll add load to the servers to show you how easy it is to get multiple transaction engines running in a live environment. We have a few of our test servers set up with a basic install and configuration. We elected to not walk through the installation process during this section of the presentation since you've already seen it. Our new environment has five Linux servers running on our cl private cloud with NuoDB Beta 8 installed and agent processes running on each. 
Remember that the agent processes must be running on all servers to facilitate connection and communication between the tiers. The first thing we'll review is how this basic setup looks in the new ODB console. So to launch the console, we'll do a quick search. Select add a domain. In the broker address, uh, we'll add the DNS name or IP address of the server that's running our broker. Username by default is domain. And password, also by default, is lowercase bird, B-I-R-D. We've been using that throughout our presentation today. We'll select join. And here we see our domain. If we expand that out, uh, what you'll notice is that that's really unlike the single domain we created earlier. Here we have multiple agents running, but no chorus, meaning no defined database, no transaction engines, no storage manager. Also, I'm sure you've noticed that each of these agents is listed as a broker. This is by default. The reason being is because we can transition any of these agents to be the broker. If we select any of them, we'll see the menu options change on the left-hand side, and we can set any of these other agents to be the preferred broker if we wanted to. Also, while it's a little hard to see, the assigned worker agent does have a different icon than the rest, and that's always the first broker that's listed here. It has a green arrow while the others do not. We're in the process of making some changes to the console for the GA release slated for later this year, and it should make some of these differences easier to spot. While we aren't walking through the basic setup, I do want to show you a different agent command and how the command works with the console behind the scenes. First, let's take note that we've got four servers running here. Um, each has an agent only. Uh, so servers P52 through P55. What we're going to do is we're going to go to our terminal. And we'll connect to server P56. We'll log in. And from here, we're going to start our agent process. And we're going to direct it to communicate with the, uh, the broker process. So just like before, I'm going to type in our Java command, java-jar. And we'll go to our installation directory. And select newoagent.jar. And here's where our command is going to be a little bit different. We're going to say, we're going to pass it the peer flag. And again, add the DNS name of our, of our broker server. And we'll add the password. Oops. Which is lowercase bird. And we see that that process starts up correctly. And when we jump back to our broker, rather when we jump back to our console, what we see right here at the end is that that new agent process has already been added to our console. What we're really seeing here is how dynamic the system can be. Once an agent starts up, it immediately communicates with the broker, lets it know that it's alive, that it's available, and we automatically add it to the console. From here, the, the setup is the same as we walked through before. We're going to add a um, transaction manager, rather a storage manager, and a transaction engine. So if we go to add process, we'll name our chorus flights, and that will be apparent uh, why we're naming it that in a few minutes. And here we go. So we'll create our storage manager on server P52. This will be in the home directory. Home build webinar archive. And we'll go ahead and initialize that. And just as before, we have our storage manager up and running. Next, we want to add a process, another process rather. We want to add a transaction engine. So we'll select server P54. Select transaction engine and DB name, DBA name, DBA, DBA, and DBA. Of course, these are not the defaults. These are just the defaults that I use. And we'll click finish. And right away we have our transaction engine up and running. 
So currently our, our system is very similar to the single node system we had earlier. Uh, we have uh, one broker agent, we have uh, one storage manager, one transaction engine. We just happen to have these other servers sitting around with agents running on them, but they aren't actually added to our chorus yet. They're a part of our domain, but not in our chorus. So currently, um, we've got this all defined. Our next step will be to set up the flights demo uh, and send some requests to the chorus. So here we go. We're going to load up the flights demo. And the flights demo is an application that NuoDB ships with um, just so end users can have something to use to uh, take a look at the system, uh, pretty much run through uh, some of the steps that we're going to do today uh, to see how uh, the, the system will scale up and down as necessary. So let's see. Here's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at settings. We're not going to spend too much time in here, uh, but in our general settings, this is where we're telling um, our uh, our demo where to look for our agents and our consoles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll close that out, and what we'll do here also is we'll go right into uh, our our new ODB console and go to our flights section, and we'll go to monitor. What we want to take a look at are the number of commits that are coming in for our transaction engine. And something great that you see here is we see our, um, our storage, uh, all of our machines in our course listed here. We've got our um, storage manager, we've got our um, transaction engine, and if we mouse over it, we'll get little, uh, little pop-ups telling us what's going on, so on and so forth. So here we go. Go ahead and load our data. You immediately start seeing that some transactions come start start coming across the wire, not too many. And we'll minimize down. And we'll see here in the background that we've got our transaction engine running, and we're seeing some real-time data coming in about the commits that are coming in, the number of client connections that we have. Uh, so not a big surprise that the number of client connections that we see here match the number of client connections we have in our uh, in our demo. So let's go ahead and increase the number of client connections. I'll set that up to two. Actually, we'll set that up to three. And it should be pointed out that what we're not doing here is we're not doing any kind of um, performance testing. Uh, this isn't speaking to the, the, um, the, the, the scalability of the product. What we really want to see here is how easy it is to bring in a, a new transaction engine and get that transaction engine to start handling some of the load. So that's what we'll do next. So what we see here, uh, we've got uh, both of our, our processes running. We've got the number of commits coming in for our transaction engine. And as we'd expect, it's handling all the load, right? We've got three connections, uh, number of commits that are 64, so on and so forth. Well, let's go ahead and add another transaction engine. So again, we'll go back to flights. We'll select server P53. And this screen's gonna look a little bit different now. We've already got a transaction engine up and running. We don't need to add any other uh, any other credentials here. Uh, the, the console remembers that, remembers who we are, that we haven't logged out, etc. And all we have to do is select transaction engine here, finish, and right away it's up and running. So let's go back here. So we see our server P54 with our transaction engine handling all the traffic. What we want to do is we want to send some traffic to that second um, that second transaction engine, and what we'll do is is we'll we'll recommend an interval, a reconnect interval. So for every 128 requests that come in, um, the application will ask the broker whether or not there's a different transaction engine uh, it should be using. And what we see here almost uh, immediately is our second transaction engine starts to receive some load, and we see it up here as well. Coming all the way across. So now that we have more transaction engines running, we can go ahead and increase the number of client threads. And we'll start to see our, our commits going up as well. Really what we're looking for here is, is not only the ease of bringing in a new um, transaction engine, but also we want to see the convergence of the commits. We want to see that the engines are all kind of running the same number of commits. They're all sort of in the same ballpark. 
go ahead and add another transaction engine, this time on server P55. Again, nothing new to add here. Uh, also, as a side note, before we go any further, we could always select Storage Manager and create a new Storage Manager on this server if we so chose. Uh, it just so happens we don't need to do that, but, um, but we could simply click Finish here and we have two Storage Managers running. So we'll make sure we select Transaction Engine, we'll select Finish. Again, it's up and running immediately. We'll go back into our monitoring and we see our new Transaction Engine here. Again, not we're handling any threads yet. But we'll give that just a few minutes, and we'll see some threads start popping in, and we'll see um, we'll see it start to match the rest of the uh, the rest of the traffic that's going on. We're also going to increase the number of connections. And here we see right away that we're starting to handle some, some commits. We've got some client connections coming in here as well up above, we're going from one to five. The number of commits is increasing. And again, we're seeing our lines starting to converge. We're seeing uh, all the traffic being handled um, by the transaction engines. And lastly, we'll go ahead and add our last transaction engine. Back to monitoring. Here we go. We'll also take this opportunity to increase our thread count again. One of the things that you'll notice on the screen here is that we're seeing um, average server latency. Um, and, and the average latency is, is because I'm currently connected to the servers via VPN connection. Uh, so I'm running this locally from my um, from my laptop, and um, you know we wouldn't expect that to be performant or as performant as as a web server or as, as an application server. As I was talking, uh, our our last transaction engine came online, and we're seeing um, some parity across all of our engines in, in terms of bringing everything online and handling the traffic that's been coming in. So at this stage, that that really uh, concludes our. Uh, our, our, our demo and our, our walkthrough today. Um, we want to thank you for joining us and uh, we'd like to leave the line open for any questions uh, that might come in. Go ahead and, and post them in the chat window and uh, we'll be sure to bring them up. Thank you very much.